Hi everyone, Saqib Khan again from the Spanish Bridge and Seismic School. I thought today we would talk a little bit about how to think about seismic loading. As structural engineers, we are really prone to thinking about loads in terms of forces, and that's valid. Most of the forces, uh, most of the loads that come onto our structures can be thought of as loads, and then we determine the capacities, we make sure that the capacities are the force capacities are larger than the force demands and when I'm, I'm using the term force in a general sense it could be bending moments or shear forces or axial forces what have you however when it comes to seismic loading it makes a lot more sense to think about the phenomenon in terms of displacement demands or deformations imposed onto your system uh, just going back to one of the concepts that I've described in one of my previous videos, the equal displacement principle, we know that an earthquake has a tendency to push a system to a certain displacement level. Okay, so if I design the system to stay elastic, I'm going to have to impart this much strength to it to meet this much displacement, okay? However, what I could do is have a system that is much weaker and then I only need to design it for this much force. The penalty, of course, that I pay is the system has to accumulate some damage through this plastic deformation that it needs to accommodate. So, in that case, I have an elastic displacement and a plastic displacement. However, from an overarching principle point of view, both systems have to go through the same displacement. So if, if we start thinking about earthquakes or seismic events as imposed displacements, things start to make a lot more sense. I also want to bring up very quickly the equal energy principle, which applies for cases where the structural period can be on, on the lower side, uh, say lower than 0 0.5, 0 0.6 seconds. In that case, an elastic system would go to there with this much delta, whereas an elastoplastic system is going to do this. So this is my delta elastic and this is my delta elastoplastic and the whole idea here is that the area under the force displacement graph of the elastic system is going to be the same as the area under the graph of the elastoplastic system. So the area under ABC, this triangle is the same as the area under ADEF. Okay, so again, the elastoplastic system will have to go through this delta, which is larger. However, the moral of the story is still the same. We can think about the force, and we have to think about the force, but at the end of the day, whether this principle holds or this principle holds, it's much better to think about the displacements because if I can make sure that my system can reach this displacement with controlled damage that ties in well with my performance, I have met the intent of the design. I could increase or decrease the level of the force, I'm going to have to go through the same displacement or a slightly larger displacement or somewhat lower displacement. However, if I get a good handle on the displacement, I will be able to design things appropriately. So the force level can be controlled by the design engineer and that's where you come in and make sure that the force level is appropriately catered for. Beyond that, we want to make sure that the displacements that are of prime concern to us are appropriately met. If your structure does not have enough ductility, if it's going to have any issue with overstrength shear or capacity protected design issues, when it reaches or tries to get to that displacement level, that's where we're going to run into issues. 
the issue is not going to be the initial strength. The issue is that you need to have enough capacity in the system to displace to the point that the earthquake is going to push it to. Okay, so let's think about this in a slightly different way. Let's think about different levels of earthquake and what we need to do to make sure that our design is appropriate. So I'm going to say that we have to look at, say, two different earthquake events. One is the one in 475 year return period. And let's say that you have some rebar yielding allowed. And so in your plastic hang zone, you are allowed to have this much rebar uh, strain. And then for a higher level event, let's say it's capped at 0 0.05. When I do my basic design, I will have my system designed to some, do something like that in a rather simple fashion. The elastic system, of course, is going to there. Now, the one in 475 is very close to its elastic or ultimate demand. So I can say, well, I have designed it for this. This was the deformation level for 475. I have met, as long as my strain in the plastic hinges is smaller than that, I've met my performance level. In a 1 in 24 75 year event, let's say my displacement demand goes there. That's the demand, the displacement demand that the earthquake is going to push your system to, whether it's elastic or elastoplastic. Okay? Now we've done our initial design and our system is going to go along this path. Okay? So the force is capped. I cannot develop more force in my system for a 24 or 75 year return period event. However, I have to make sure that my system can reach that point and when it reaches that point of that displacement level that the strain in my rebar is less than or equal to 0 0.05. Only then will I have met my performance level. So you can see that thinking in terms of force beyond this point to meet this performance level is rather meaningless. Whereas when we think about displacements, we can actually go a long way in terms of polishing our understanding of the earthquake phenomenon. So to wrap up, think about the seismic demand as imposed displacements. And as a result, you get local deformations in your components that you need to take care of. So thank you for listening to me and we will talk about some other interesting topic in the near future. Thank you.